to another episode of Dialogue. My guest today is Mustafa Akyol, who is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and I think one of the most important Islamic intellectuals uh, at work today. Mustafa's on a mission to modernize the Muslim world, which I think we all agree is a pretty important challenge that faces us today. And in particular, we dive into his new book, which is called Reopening Muslim Minds, a Return to Reason, Freedom, and Tolerance. And uh, I found the book really a, a tour de force, honestly. It's um, sweeping history and politics and personal experience and some pretty deep theology as well. And that's because Mustafa's come to the view that Islam can't become compatible with liberal ideals like human rights and gender equality unless Islam itself becomes more liberal. So in other words, he has to win the, the theological argument first. So we spend quite a bit of time on that. We also talk about the road not taken towards an Islamic enlightenment and some of the key liberal figures from uh, Islamic history, like Ibn Rushd, who introduced Aristotle to the West, uh, also the only Muslim in uh, Raphael's famous painting, The School of Athens. Uh, and, and we also tease apart and talk about the interpretation of three key strands of, of Islamic teachings, the Quran, the hadiths, which are the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, and then Sharia law. And the, the, the difference and overlap between those three is really pretty important to understand. But we start with how the work has actually influenced him personally, including in his home country of Turkey, as well as how after giving a speech in Malaysia in which he argued that you cannot police religion, he was arrested and jailed by the Malaysian religion police, which would be sort of Python-esquely funny if it hadn't been so scary. It led to what he describes as the, the worst night of his life. I also just want to take a moment to thank all of you who've been listening to this pretty new podcast dialogues, and especially to those who have taken the time to rate on Apple uh, podcasts uh, and so on. I really I appreciate you listening and I, I appreciate your support. And now into today's conversation about how to liberalize Islam. Mustafa, welcome to Dialogues. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to do this with you. Now, I said, I said, tried to say it right, but M Mustafa. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah, Mustafa. Thank you. I'll take it. Um, we've worked together. I actually first worked with you as a result of an introduction from our mutual friend, Shadi Hamid, on the issue of the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, where you're from, and the noises from Erdogan that he was going to convert it back to a mosque. Uh, and I came up with what I thought was the very novel idea that the space should be shared between Christians and Muslims. I'm Eastern Orthodox, you're, uh, and you're a Muslim. And I thought, what a great idea. No one's thought of that. And it turned out you'd thought of it years before and already written about it. But you graciously agreed to co-author this piece, which says, look, it's been a church for a thousand years, a mosque for 500 years, a museum for a hundred years. There's got to be a way to find pluralism around this. Um, needless to say, Erdogan didn't listen to us. But what was striking to me, right, work on the piece with you, is that I think you, you took some heat, even for suggesting the idea that this religious space could be shared between Muslims and Christians, given its history. And it, even that was something that, that caused you some difficulty, and in some ways highlights some of the issues we're going to get into around pluralism and tolerance and liberalism. Indeed, Richard. Uh, it was a pleasure to co-author that piece with you. I mean, I, as you said, I had been advocating uh, sharing Hagia Sophia since early 2000s in Turkey. I mean, some people made that argument, few people, and I, honestly, I'm one of those, uh, because it was always a dream for Turkey's religious conservatives to turn this museum into a place of worship. And I said, you know what? Place of worship sounds good to me. It's religious freedom, and I'm a Muslim. I'm not offended by the idea that we, we can pray in it. It's wonderful. But Christians have a heritage here, too, so let's honor this, and let's do this in a way we can share it, and which is not impossible, which is not unheard of in Islamic history, by the way. Um, but, of course, when I was making these arguments in early 2000s, Turkey was in a trajectory which you'd think these things are possible. You know, Erdogan was leading the alliance of civilizations with Spain, and he was trying to get into EU. There was a lot of emphasis in the tolerism of Ottoman heritage and so on and so forth. Turkey just got into a very different direction <laughs> in the grim one, honestly, a very disappointing mm. one for people like me who had better hopes. Uh, authoritarian, uh, very parochial, uh, rabid nationalism, very anti-Western especially. Uh, and sometimes that includes anti-Christian or anti-Semitic themes as well. So that has become very dominant in the uh, ruling narrative. Uh, and of course, therefore, the calls for Hagia Sophia 
to make Hagia Sophia a shared space didn't go well. And you're right. I mean, after we wrote that article, I was uh, slammed in Turkey's one of top selling newspapers. Well, it's top selling because it's freely distributed because it's sponsored by the government. It's a pro-government it's like newspaper. It's sort of Turkish equivalent of Pravda or something. But you're, I mean, it's, it's, it was a big yeah, picture it's of the, you tell, calling you a blasphemer. A traitor. And, you know, a traitor, yeah. yeah, tra- yeah. A traitor, I mean, yeah. A traitor. And uh, the thing is, there. you said the Turkish version of Pravda, that's a very accurate term. But what I'm saying is there are about a dozen Turkish Pravdas. They're just the same thing with different names coming out every day with the same goal of praising uh, the president and demonizing his enemies. So I was slammed there as a traitor, you know, to the country and, and the national cause. Nobody really read what, what I really wrote there. And, and uh, we were trying to respectfully make an argument saying that President Erdogan, why don't you consider this option? And uh, unfortunately, that's the sign of times in my country, which uh, shattered some of my earlier hopes. But it is, it's a lesson in the sense that, well, if you don't really try to cultivate liberal values of pluralism and toleration and rational discourse, and if you boil, if you rather collapse into hatred and conspiracy theory and, and, and triumphalism, which happens not just in Turkey, by the way, but we see that in, in, in U.S. politics, unfortunately, too, uh, not in the same level, but it's still concerning. Uh, which is a lesson for, yeah, I mean, to cultivate what I call liberal values. Uh, and, and I've been someone who's, who are trying to reconcile them with my faith tradition, which is Islam. And the fact that Turkey is not in a good place today uh, sh- shows to me that this is not impossible, but this is a big battle. And that's mm. one reason I wrote this new book, which in which I say, OK, let's get to the da- bottom of this. We have really serious issues to talk about. Yeah, so I'm really excited to dig in on your book and congratulations on it on it too. Um, I gave a little a short version uh, of it in the introduction to this, but um, we will get into get into it. And actually, just to underline this point that for you, this is personal in various ways. This isn't just personal in the intellectual sense of how can I be a good liberal and a good Muslim, but also just the very fact that you're saying some of these things puts you occasionally at personal risk. And so when you're writing about these things. It's not just theoretical for you. After you open the book with something ha- with what happened to you in Malaysia um, and, and how that affected you, it's a it's a terrific story, and it'd be great just if you could tell a story of what happened to you in Malaysia uh, as a way to kind of get us into the conversation. Sure, uh, and thank you for your kind words, uh, Richard, about my book. Uh, I should say that Malaysia has been almost a hub for me in the past decade. Uh, Like my work has been noticed there by liberal leaning Malay Muslim organizations. Uh, One of them is the Islamic Renaissance Front, which invited me to Malaysia five times in 10 years, published my um, book in Malay, reprinted my articles. uh, And Islamic Renaissance Front is an organization that defends human rights and liberty with Islamic arguments. And again, we are not secular liberals. I mean, people, when the term liberal generally sometimes implies that. No, we are Islamic liberals in the sense that we're trying to work within our own religious tradition. Anyway, so the incident that I relate in the beginning of my book took place in 2017, September, when I went to Malaysia for the fifth time for a series of lectures, uh, public talks and panels. And uh, the most sensitive one was on the issue of apostasy, uh, which is, of course, publicly changing, renouncing our religion. And uh, apostasy is not a crime, luckily, in many parts of the world. But in about a dozen Muslim-majority societies, it's considered a crime punishable by death. Uh, That is the case in Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Afghanistan, several other countries. Uh, But Malaysians are proudly moderate, so they're not doing what the Saudis are doing. So they're not executing the apostates, but they're sending them to rehabilitation centers. And in this lecture of mine, which is still available on the Internet, I think, I gave this 30-minute talk saying that, listen, I'm a Muslim. We don't want to lose people, right? We don't want people abandoning faith in Islam. But if they do, there's nothing you can do about it with coercion. Uh, just respect their freedom of conscience. Uh, I refer to a Quranic verse, which is the kind of motto of all the 
liberal uh, or libertarian minded Muslims, la ikra din, which is which means there is no compulsion in religion. Uh, and and I refer to Islamic scholars, which take that as the basis of the approach to issues of religious freedom. Uh, I said yes. In classical Islamic jurisprudence, apostasy was considered as a crime, but that's what the Byzantines did at the time. Uh, that was what the Sassanid Empire did. It was the pre-modern world where your religious allegiance was also your allegiance to the ruler, and uh, so abandoning the religion implied political rebellion. It's a different world today. That's totally irrelevant. Uh, and I said at the end, well, religion cannot be policed. I mean, if, you, if people don't believe in religion, you cannot really police it. Uh, and soon after that, the religion police walked into the hall and they said, well, we are the people you'll be speaking about. Uh, and uh, they interrogated me a little bit there and they let me go that night. But the next day they released an arrest order. They watched the video and decided that I violated the law of teaching Islam without permission. You know, that's, that, there's a law about that. Uh, and I was arrested at the airport. And they, when they arrested me, they said, uh, you're charged with breaking the law and, and the punishment is two years in jail and some financial uh, thing. So I, I was like, I just, I'm just going back to my wife and kids. And, oh, like two years in jail. Like mm. that was really a, a terrible night. Uh, I didn't know what would happen. Were you, were you, were you genuinely afraid that, that this was at that point, you must have thought this could be serious. They, they, they may not be messing. Were you, were you seriously sitting there in that cell thinking, wow, I might be about to spend some time in jail because of a 30 yeah, minute talk? I yeah. Did. Yeah. I mean, that was probably the worst night I had, uh, in my life. Like I was saying, why, like, what, what am I doing here? Like I, by, at the time I was in Wellesley college in Massachusetts. So I had come from Wellesley to Kuala Lumpur, the other end of the world, just for a five day tour of events. And my wife had given birth to our second son just a few weeks ago. And I was like, what did I put myself in? And do, will these people really put me in jail? Like, I, I didn't know. I, it was very uh, stressful. And, uh, and I was released thanks to some diplomacy. I mean, uh, my wife called my father in mm. Turkey, who's a friend of you Turkey's told, former you president. You told the story yeah. of, yes, of he how called you were able to... Yeah. the Malay royalty and they called some people and just it's, it, it worked. And I'm lucky. And again, I don't want to exaggerate uh, my experience there. People go through much more horrible experiences. People spend years in jail in, in much more worse conditions. So, but 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 uh, I use that story to say, hey, listen, we have an issue here, right? We have an issue called religious policing, which is wrong, and I think is Islamically wrong. It's there in the Islamic tradition, and I also say that, well, if you look at classical jurisprudential texts in Islam, yes, there is religious policing. It's called hispa. That's why I have a chapter in my book, you know, mm. that. Uh, so I use that incident to show that we have a problem in the current Muslim majority world, not all of it, but in certain countries, because we have a problem in the mainstream Islamic jurisprudential tradition, which is coercion in the name of religion. That is about yeah. religious policing, apostasy laws, blasphemy laws. And I think these coercive measures have brought the Islamic world to really a crisis. A lot of people are yeah. reacting to it. People are afraid of it. It's, it's suffocating these societies intellectually. And as someone who's concerned about the future of my fate, I want to look in, I wanted to look into these issues and say, hey, listen, this is how we can rethink on all of these issues without abandoning our faith uh, or be abandoning uh, just understanding that it has a historical baggage that we can uh, question today. It has a uh, it does a really great dive into all of these issues. I must say I learned kind of a, a huge amount from it. But something you said a moment ago, I want to come back to which you also say in the book, which is your case for a liberal Islam, or if you like, uh, an Islamic liberalism, uh, or whatever, the, we can maybe get into the difference. Islamic liberalism is the term I do use, yes. You do, and you talk about an Islamic enlightenment, and you say, I really mean Islamic enlightenment. I am not speaking about a wholesale adoption of Western enlightenment. You say it very, very, very clearly. So what what's the difference, do you think? Or, or let's say you're successful... I very much hope you are, and there is an enlightenment you talk about. How do you think uh, the Islamic enlightenment will be different to the Western enlightenment? So if I'm, or put it differently, if I'm in a, an enlightened 
lib- uh, Islamic society, how will it look and feel different to a Western one? In other words, what's the difference between your Islamic enlightenment and I'll, and I'll take the mantle of Western enlightenment liberal as mil uh, biographer. So yeah, sure, what's, sure. what's different? What's different about yours? Well, the main difference will be that they will be referring to different texts and traditions. I mean, when you read John Locke, a letter concerning toleration, John Locke is obviously referring to the Bible. <laughs> he's referring to Christ. And he's, he's saying that there is nothing under the, in, in the Bible about a Christian commonwealth. So I say there should be no Muslim commonwealth like, like an Muslim, Islamic state. But my reference is, is the Quran. But do we arrive at the same point? Basically, yes. There will be just certain cultural differences and nuances. I mean, today there are Western liberal democracies. France is not the exact same thing with the United States, or UK is not the exact same thing with Germany. You know, they have different nuances in their laws, but they all agree on what we can, what we call broadly human rights, and the idea that human rights should be about the state. Uh, is generally respected. It is not sometimes respected at all, I mean, in certain cases, but, but then you can push against that with a certain reference. I think uh, in France, if uh, people, some of the hardcore defenders of laïcité get their way and ban headscarf on the streets, I hope the European Court of Human Rights will say no to that, at least. Uh, it should have said no to other limitations on the hijab as well, I mean, headscarf as well. So uh, there are nuances in Western societies, too. And uh, I, I think, for example, in a, in a Muslim-majority society, m- maybe there will be more understanding towards polygamy instead of gay marriage. I mean, those cultural norms will influence, inevitably, the democratic discussion about you know, values in society. Yes. Uh, but, but it should be minimum that nobody should be persecuted because of his lifestyle, whether that should be a gay lifestyle or so. I mean, there are certain things that the culture gets in the way, and it does. I mean, uh, that's why there are some dry zones in uh, Bible Belt in America, and you don't have the same thing. And so there are there will be cert- in every society, I think. Uh, but ultimately, the Islamic Enlightenment I'm calling for is about giving up coercive power in the name of Islam, in the sense that we should have no apostasy laws, we should not have no blasphemy laws, religion should not be imposed through threats, through violence, and the critique of religion should not be silenced by force. Uh, and I have no problem in Muslims being pious and conservative. Like, I, I would defend the right of very ultra conservative Muslims to live in the way they want uh, in Europe or in, in of course in their home countries if if they are immigrants. Um, but I I will defend the right of atheists and uh, secular people or you know the quote unquote uh, heretical Muslims uh, give them full equal rights. So I don't know where it will exactly go and mm. how it would exactly look because this is ultimately a social process mm. that you cannot envision, but respect for human rights should be established and human rights defined universally. Yes. N- it, not it saying sounds- that, oh, in Islam, we, yeah. we have human rights already, but that means women should yeah. get uh, less rights than men. And that's how it is. Well, there's a reason why universe, uh, like universal consensus of humanity headed towards something that we call equality under the law. Yes, and you make the point that some of the declarations of human rights from Islamic countries have had some big, big gaps in them. But this, this question of, I mean, it's interesting your example of maybe polygamy versus same-sex marriage. These cultural differences you may you may see emerging, but really to kind of push forward on the similarities, you talk a lot about the importance of uh, free speech and of allowing contest to religion. And obviously this gets you into the whole issue of blasphemy and so on. Actually, it's a good moment, I think, to emphasize the title of your book, which is Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return 
to reason, freedom, and tolerance. So these are very carefully chosen words, right? It's not opening Muslim minds, <laughs> why we should embrace it. It's a reopening, a return. And, it, and I think you tell the story about the kind of the dead end that Islam's at now, but the kind of great beginning. And you've written about the Islamic precursors of the European Enlightenment. You had a great Times piece uh, about that, actually. But there's one figure in particular that I didn't know anything like enough about until reading a book. It really threads all the way through a 12th century figure. And forgive me if I garble the name, but it's uh, Abul Walid Muhammad Ibn Rushd. So Ibn Rushd, I think, is a, a shorthand. There's a statue of him in Kolboda. Really fascinating figure who influenced the European Enlightenment and so on, and actually really pushed this idea of free speech and critical religion. But tell us, give, me a, give us a brief biographical sketch of this figure, because he clearly has influenced you quite significantly and, and then influenced others. As you point out, Jonathan Sachs has done a whole thing about how he influenced the Enlightenment and so on. But talk a bit about Ibn Rushd and, and why he's been such an important figure for you. Definitely. And I should have just one more thing, which is what I said about different kinds of uh, trajectories. I'm not defending polygamy or I'm not a fan of it. And actually, in my book, I, I do criticize it because I think it mm. was a pre-modern form of a marriage that was necessary or legitimate in a society where you always had the lack of men because of constant warfare. So there was a social context. So I'm, I'm critical of polygamy. But I was just saying that if in the Enlightenment, you make the argument that state should be neutral towards lifestyles, those lifestyles will be a little bit different in, from this society, that society, because of the natural ways of life there. But it, won't be, to, but it won't be coerced, is your It point. won't be coerced, like, what, yeah. That's the Let key, state key, not get into movies. people's lives. Well, what they do with those lives will be a little bit different depending on the existing norms. Key, and, but as, lo as long right as long as they have exit power interestingly mill because, exactly wrote yeah. about wrote about polygamy in the u.s and said leave the mormons alone because everyone was getting ready to abolish polygamy and he's like no just leave them alone i'm not in favor of polygamy yeah, uh, you know, yeah, this is yeah, mill yeah same reasons as you but he said but that's not the same thing as coercively forbidding it just exactly. as long as people are choosing it right exactly yeah and and, uh, and again these are very complex issues. I just want to, give an, mm. want to give an example, but also clarify that. Well, coming back to your question, why do I use the word reopening Muslim minds? Mm. Because I have the conviction that, as, and that came by studying the Islamic tradition itself over the years, that, well, there were some insights in early Islam that actually can help us today. But those insights, although they were very influential and they accomplished a lot in that era, were pushed aside or forgotten. I speak about the uncultivated seeds of freedom uh, in Islam in, in one of the passages in my book. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ibn Rushd is an example of what I'm talking about here. And, and even before getting into that, I should recall that. I mean, we are speaking about the uh, freedom deficit in the Muslim world or that we need more toleration. These are new problems. I mean, new being in the past few centuries, we're discussing about these problems. If we, somebody beamed us back to a thousand years ago, we would probably be speaking about why Christians are so intolerant and why can't be like the Muslims, right, to actually allow, you know, some diversity. And, and you know, they as, Jews are a testimony to this, right? I mean, there has been so many episodes of Jews fleeing from Christendom into the lands of Islam, especially the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottomans were more tolerant. So... Uh, so there is something that went wrong at a late stage, uh, I think, in Islam. But that began with the uh, loss of the early cosmopolitanism and diversity of thought. Uh, I, I'd say that there is a golden Islamic age, Islamic golden age, and it was marked by cosmopolitanism when Muslims uh, of certain persuasions didn't shy away from studying Greek philosophy. Uh, and learning some insights from Aristotle or Plato and trying to reconcile them with Islam. They believed in the universal human reason as a, as a source of value. And that was very def definitive. And that was why we, one reason why we were so a magnificent of a civilization, but we lost that. Now, in Ibn Rushd, uh, I have a chapter on him in my book. You see that very clearly. Uh, he is he's famous in the West as Averroes. Why is he famous? Mm. Because uh, he is the one from which Western Europeans rediscovered Aristotle. Mm -hmm. uh, he his commentaries on Aristotle, three layered, very detailed commentaries, became the very source of the Averroists. You know, they, as they emerge in France, 
uh, and also Christian theologians like Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so he really ignited an intellectual revolution in the 13th century uh, Europe, basically. And he's famous for that, oh, the Muslim who brought uh, Aristotle back to uh, Europe. And that's why Raphael, in his famous painting of Athens, uh, School of Athens, he has a place for Ibn Rushd there. But there is something else about Ibn Rushd that is little known, both in the West and in the Muslim world as well. And that's what I look into. Uh, how did his philosophy influence his outlook on Islam? Uh, because, this is important because he was not just a philosopher, but he was a jurist. He was a qadr. He was uh, his job was to interpret the Sharia, and he has this uh, famous book, which is very actually established Bidayat al Mujtahid, which is a, uh, the distinguished jurist primer, as it is known. So he had he had something to say about Islamic jurisprudence, the uh, the methods of Islamic jurisprudence. Now there are certain things he said that are little known. And, and unluckily, we have some of them not from the Arabic originals, but from the Hebrew <laughs> translations, because the Arabic originals were burned. So, for example, in one place, he says, uh, this we have in Arabic, but uh, another part is not available in Hebrew. He says, there are written laws of every society. I'm paraphrasing. But then there are unwritten laws that are inherent in human nature. Things like conscience or compassion or a sense of justice. Mm -hmm. He says these written and unwritten laws can sometimes conflict with each other. If there is such a conflict, we should reinterpret the written laws. Now, this is a huge statement which is little noticed and scholars like Karen Talifiero or uh, Ferial Buha wrote about this and this recently came up. I mean, there is recent scholarship. Um, he believes in something that we call natural law. Like there are values inherent in human nature, and there are laws, there are religious laws. There's the Sharia, there's the Halakha, there's, you know, canon laws, or, I mean, uh, there are laws of society, countries, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they are important. But, and he says something also interesting. He says, nobody can write laws that are valid for all times and places. So, uh, the great Islamic jurists had an idea about apostasy in the 10th century. Maybe it made sense in that context, you know, but like everybody was doing that way. But now the context has dramatically changed. Can we say, oh, that was for that context, but, we, we, but this is now really unconscientious to kill somebody for apostasy or punish him. So we should let this go. Can we make this? So can we put something about Islamic jurisprudence, that's fiqh, that says the interpretation of sharia, can we believe in something universal? Which, by the way, that universal, I think, written, unwritten laws of humanity has evolved into universal declaration of human rights. I mean, what can be more tangible if there is something called natural law, if all humanity, most of it, I mean, agreed that, okay, we believe in these rights. So, I, from Ibn Rushd, I take the idea that uh, you can, there is legitimacy for accepting something called Universal Declaration of Human Rights from an Islamic point of view and looking back into uh, Sharia. Now, when you look back into Sharia, I'm not going to say Muslims should say, well, we don't care what it says. But if you have this tension, you do something which not all Muslims do, which is called wrestling with the text, right? You, you read something in text, but you say, wait a minute, this sounds unfair. This sounds unjust. There's a, so let's try to understand this again. And you look more carefully. Oh, you look, you start to use hermeneutics. You start to say, okay, uh, well, God gave men uh, twice the share of uh, women in, in inheritance. Why? Mm. Oh, mm. then you say, well, you can make the argument, well, in 7th century Arabia, that was actually quite a generous amount. <laughs> Men were the uh, financial responsible uh, agent in every, yes. in every society. So giving it was quite liberal, share, it, quite liberal, it was amazing. Liberal, yeah, to give women a third of it. But today you still have most, uh, uh, I think, almost all of the Arabic. Uh, yeah, I was we still have that this, law. Still have that law. law. The, yeah, in the Tunisia, law. they were debating while I was writing this yeah. book, and I referred to that. Can we really change this? Because... If you don't have this, you're, you, all you're left with is textualism. This is written, so we have to implement this. And this has become a slogan. I mean, we hear and we obey. 
So this is piety. God said, and we obey. Well, God said something, but if you obey in, in that perspective, you might end up violating the intentions of God. You might do the, you can do the letter of the law, but the intention of the law can get lost. But do we have rational tools to discuss the intentions of the law, to discern them, to, to take them as something even from the letter of the law itself? Well, that opens a lot of theological uh, discussions, which is why my book is doing a lot of theology. It does a lot. It does. Yeah. It's a very yeah. theological book. And I think it's a, a, that is a revolution, as you say. I mean, Rush's view about the t how do you treat the text and you engage with the text and you bring your own reason and you put it in context is radically different to the jurisprudential turn that Islam took. And actually, you have a fantastic example I didn't even know from the UK from um, uh, an imam in Leicester, I think, saying that women can't travel alone more oh, yes. than three days journey, which is 48 miles because it's based on how far you could walk in three days. And he reaffirms that's still the case in 21st century UK, even though you can, you can actually, you know, 48 miles isn't very far. And so women are not allowed to travel alone, uh, Muslim women in the UK, uh, because, that, because he has failed, he's failed the rushed test here of saying, yeah. why did we have that rule that women weren't allowed to travel alone for more than three days back in whenever it was? And is that still true in 21st century England? And yeah. yeah. I mean, Ibn Rushd's approach has remained the road not taken. Uh, and I show the consequences of that. I mean, I try to show the consequences of that. Uh, he had, thanks to that view, he had quite progressive views on women. He criticizes the enfeebling of women in Muslim societies. He says, uh, they have the same intellectual capacity with men. So the reason why they just, we put them down into just baby uh, raising and uh, uh, homework, that is because we don't acknowledge their intellectual capacity. He criticizes aggressive jihad idea, saying that God could not have intended the destruction caused by war. So it's, it is preferable to, uh, it, is, it, is, it is correct to prefer peace. So, uh, uh, and uh, the, the example you gave is actually quite a good example of literalism in my book about the Sharia, how the Sharia stagnated. Uh, we, we, and I think uh, our audience can recall that in Saudi Arabia, there are these long discussion of whether women can drive a car, right? And when the crown prince, the autocratic crown prince, which, you know, needs some publicity in the West said, oh, I'm allowing women to drive right now. What an amazing thing. Okay, that's fine, but why do we have this idea in Saudi Arabia that women are not allowed to drive, right? Well, it goes back to uh, the injunction that I referred to, uh, and the fatwas, you know, based on those, which is the idea that women should not travel alone, which comes from hadiths, which is sayings of Prophet Muhammad. Now, uh, this is interesting. The whole notion of travel is very interesting. Also, it's in the Quran. It's not about woman, whether women can travel or not, but the, there are verses in the Quran about to whom you can give your religious zakat, which is your um, uh, religious donations, right? I mean, you can give it to the poor, you can give it to the orphans, and you can give to those who are traveling. Now, traveling must be a hard thing, <laughs> So that you have to really take care of people who are traveling. Like in the modern day and age, I mean, if you're taking a business flight from New York to London, you really are not <laughs> somebody who has to be taken care of, right? Who, who needs some religious donations well, to you survive. Have to be brought, you have to be brought a few nuts and a gin and tonic or something if, if you drink. Yeah, I mean, no, so but... the, the whole notion of travel in 7th seven, seven century Arabia is that something you do on, uh, on camels on the desert where there are really bandits and it's very dangerous. It's very likely that you can be attacked. So women were not allowed to, uh, to travel alone because they would very likely be to attacked and raped and in, attacked in all horrible ways. So protect them with a man next to them, with, with guy who can use a sword. Now, that is the, I, when I read the hadith, I say, okay, this is the intention behind that, which is security. Security is a universal uh, rule in everywhere. Today, it's not maybe about this. Today, it can be more about fastening your seatbelts rather than, you know, not driving alone. But our scholar, the one I quoted in, in the UK, says, well, some people are making that argument. He says, yes, context change. But still, we have to obey it because the prophet, peace be upon him, said so. So it leads to literalism. 
So this d- the denial of natural law uh, in, in the Islamic tradition has led to literalism, which we see every day in all these issues. I, I pointed out. It also leads to the denial of universalism, because if there is no natural law, if, if there is no universal ethical compass of humanity, why would you care about what the quote-unquote infidels say about things? Yes. I mean, in some ways, at least he was a he was an honest literalist in the sense that he said, I agree that it appears to make no sense anymore, and I'm not going to try and make it make sense, but that doesn't matter because it was it's, it's the word we have to follow. And I think that a really interesting part of your book, and I learned a lot from this, is the way you break down what can be taken from the Quran and understood from the Quran, the hadiths that you just referred to, and then what that meant for Sharia. And I think that the relationship between the Quran, the Hadiths, and Sharia and law, and it was very legalistic because because Islam became a state almost immediately. Mm-hmm. This synthesis of church and state, religion and state, happened. Yeah, I, I think it happened pretty early in Christianity too, to be honest. But but was there from the beginning. So, and you're much more skeptical about the way that Hadiths are used. In some ways, you think we have to be much more cautious about. It. So, can you just do the sort of brief survey of how the Quran, the Hadiths, and the uh, words in the Sharia relate to each other as scriptural texts? Because I think from a kind of Christian perspective, that's not, from the outside, the, the Islamic tradition, I don't think it's clear. Those mm-hmm. distinctions are not made clear. Mm-hmm. I think in a lot of people's minds, these all get blurred up and the difference between mm-hmm. Hadith and uh, so mm-hmm. Talk a bit about those, sure. those three. Sure. Uh, and I agree that from a Christian background, these legal issues in Islam are sometimes hard to uh, fully understand at the first sight. It might be easier for someone with a Jewish background because the Sharia is actually very much similar to the Halakha. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big difference being it became a state law also and it became strongly identified with states for a long time. Um, now, in this, here is one thing. I'm relying on a tradition of scholarship called broadly Islamic modernism. This began in the 19th century. It's still, Fazlur Rahman was a great scholar in the 20th century, which is really probably the pioneer of it, the big, and I refer to him a lot. And there are Islamic modernists in Turkey and Indonesia today and, and elsewhere. And what we're saying is basically, look, we are loyal to the divine core of our tradition, but there are many layers on top of it that are really human interpretation and, and also contextual and everything. So we have to uh, unpack all this. Now, when we unpack all this, uh, there are several levels, layers of argumentation. First is the Quran. And uh, non-Muslims sometimes assume that whatever you see in the Sharia, it must be in the Quran, which is not at all. <laughs> right. A few things, yes. The Quran has about 100 verses about from 6,000 uh, and more uh, that are legal in nature. Just five or six of them are really about uh, penal code, about like corporal punishments and but much of the Sharia doesn't come from the Quran. Uh, it comes from Hadiths. What are Hadiths? Hadiths are reported sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. In a sense, Hadiths are a bit like the Gospels. Hmm. Like, yeah. uh, if a the Quran later, is maybe. Christ himself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, Hadiths are like, you know, you read Gospel of Luke, who says, I saw Christ and he did this and so on and so forth. Well, uh, I don't know, Luke saw him, but I'm confused about that. But anyway, there are people who mm-hmm. are disciples and who wrote about what and they saw don't agree, or what and they, they don't heard. Agree, they, and they don't agree with each other. And John yeah, was written a, cent- a century later, and half the time you, you, people, Christian scholars are like, well, Luke says this, but John says this. Exactly, exactly. So hadiths are, so the Quran is, interesting, the Quran is not the words of the prophet. It is, it is not, it, the Quran doesn't tell you much about the prophet because it's speaking to the prophet. It's divine voice speaking to him. Uh, then the hadith, hadiths are, uh, and the sirah, the biography literature, which is also comes with the hadiths. It's it's the whole pool of information about what happened. They tell us what the prophet did or say, but it comes through a chain of transmitters. Prophet uh, Prophet Muhammad said this, and then Abu Huraira, uh, you know, saw that, and he and from him, this other guy learned him, and from him, this several generations pass. And then ultimately five, six people tell, told to each other, and then it's established that you know the prophet said, do, do, do this. The ban on blasphemy uh, and apostasy, they come from hadiths. Like there's nothing in the Quran about apostasy laws. There's a hadith which says, whomever leaves his religion, kill him. So that's the beginning of all the trouble there, honestly. Yeah. Now, the question, 
the question about the hadith, the perennial question is, how authentic they really are. <laughs> because the Quran was preserved and written down by the community right after the Prophet. It was the only text that the Muslims preserved for about a century. Hadith, hadith were oral traditions. People were saying to each other. And actually, we know that the Prophet even banned writing any hadith from him for a while. Because they say, because he thought it would be mixed with the Quran, so he didn't want to, want, want to avoid that. But they were not written down until the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, which is after the first four caliphs. And much of the troubling aspects of the Sharia, from a liberal point of view, 90% of them are coming from the Hadiths. Uh, there are some issues in the Quran too, especially corporal pun in terms of corporal punishments and jihad, but they're really contextual. If you understand the Quran in a contextual way, there is really no tension, I, I can say, between be, believe, being a fervent believer in the Quran and uh, believing in the modern values of human rights. And there, and there are often, you point out that there are very often other texts in the Quran which can balance those statements uh, as well. And so to some extent, like in any religion, it's the, the danger is of cherry picking. The danger yeah. is that you point to one verse in the Quran and it seems pretty clear, like, leave the religion and you get killed or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's the hadith. And, but, and, um, well, you, you, you brought me something good there. Uh, actually, the Quran was cherry picked authoritatively already, but in a bad way. <laughs> Right. Uh, yes. uh, that is uh, that's well. You would say that, wouldn't you? Because you don't like the cherry picking. But I'm not disagreeing with you. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the someone's is, picking the cherries. You can't avoid. We're the fact. The, right. We're picking the right. cherries, and while we're doing that, I refer to natural law. Right. I mean, uh, I refer to universal human values. So the cherry picking I'm telling you about is called uh, nes in Arabic, which is abrogation in English. Mm. Basically, the Quran was a compilation of messages given to Prophet Muhammad in a series of events in 23 years. So it's not a book that really comes from a beginning introduction and just follows a like a linear uh, pattern. So when you read the Quran, if you read Surah Al-Tawbah, which is one of the last surahs which came through uh, during the war between the polytheists and the Byzantine Empire... Uh, there was going to be a war, but it didn't happen. There are verses about go and fight the unbelievers, right? But when you read the other parts of the Quran, it says, say to them, to you, your religion, to me, mine. So are you fighting the unbelievers because they're unbelievers? Are you fighting the unbelievers because they attack you in the first place? Uh, if they never attack you, would you attack them? These are big questions. And what has happened as a major trouble, I think, in classical Sunni Islamic tradition is jurists uh, gradually, and especially the, specifically the jurists that were allied with the empires that were ruling the Islamic civilization at the time, they said the verses about war against the unbelievers abrogate the peaceful verses that, was, that were, were earlier in the uh, Meccan period. Now... Mm -hmm. This is, not, this is not something that is in the Quran itself. Quran doesn't say, you know, these verses are gone. It's the jurists who made this decision. So, and I, what I'm saying is that, well, it was a decision made by medieval jurists according to medieval norms. They uh, were uh, living in a world of empires. The Muslim empires wanted to expand like the Christian empires wanted to expand. So they needed the doctrine of an aggressive jihad. So verses in the Quran that would not justify aggressive jihad and that would also call for religious pluralism were either abrogated or trivialized. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, well, this was an imperialistic agenda. It's not something a, it's not a religious a sacred decision that we Muslims have to be following today. Yeah. So they weren't doing it in a vacuum as as, you know, the religions are, are human too and this issue of abrogation was something I really can learn from it's, it's an exaggeration to say it's a bit like those kind of redacted reports you get from the CIA with like bits to, but, but, and it's also not clear to me who has the authority to abrogate I mean it's very different to the Roman Catholic Church where you, know, you have papal infallibility and it's like well if the Pope says that's how to interpret that line in St. Paul then that's how you're supposed to interpret the line it's at least clear, I don't agree with it but so it's clear, whereas here it's a little bit less clear 
on whose authority stuff gets abrogated, but it did. And that contributed to this dead end that you write about mm. that, that Islam kind of ran into and so the, the path not taken and why you have a good case, I think, for saying return. As long as you take a long view, mm -hmm. uh, you can use this, the language of kind of returning. Exactly. And on. Yeah. Who made that abrogation? Well, as you said, Islam is not like Catholicism where you have one. Maybe Shia tra Shiite tradition is a bit similar to Catholicism in the sense that you have an Grand Ayatollah sometimes, which can make binding uh, decisions. But in the Sunni world, it is just like Judaism. There's just scholars, and there are people who follow those scholars, or some scholars associated with the state, and their authority is established by the state as the official view. That has happened a lot uh, in, in the Sunni world, and gradually more so uh, compared to, to the beginning. And ultimately... Uh, the whole idea that there is a verse in the Quran which speaks of abrogation, but it doesn't. It, it's not clear whether it is speaking about the that Islam abrogates former religions or verses in the Quran abrogate each other. Even if, if it does, who decides which verses are abrogated mm. or not? So there is a huge room. And one thing I should say: some of the problems I have criticized in the book have already been opened up and revisited a little bit, like. The idea of an aggressive jihad has been criticized in the modern era, and it has become a bit more mainstream view to say that, no, 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 actually, we don't do aggressive jihad. Jihad is just defensive. So that's as actually now that has become the conservative position. The mil I mean, really extremists will still believe in uh, aggressive jihad. But I'm saying because it became, some issues became just indefensible and irrational to push forward. But the abrogation uh, on other issues, like to you, your religion, to me, mine, it's still there. I mean, on some issues, a few steps have been taken back. And I own, I show, for example, in slavery, there has been a huge reform in the Sharia already. I mean, Islamic world gave up on slavery, which was an integral part of the Sharia. Uh, and it wasn't easy. You know, it was a similar battle, uh, like religious freedom today. I mean, some people said, how can you dare, you know, change something that is justified in, in our traditional mm -hmm. uh, Sharia? But it, it happened. But I'm showing that we have other problems to solve. And we, that's why I'm saying I'm trying to push the Islamic enlightenment go forward. I'm just not enlightening, but I'm trying to show where it's got stuck and what is really the battleground and, and how can we rethink these issues by any educated Muslim who doesn't have to be a, the most greatest expert on theology or jurisprudence. Yeah, and I feel I feel like the um, the win on slavery is hugely important because it sets a precedent. Once you agree that the context has changed, then you open the door potentially to to looking at other things. But precisely for that, because I'm sorry, no. there are precisely for because of that, there are scholars, smart scholars, who are now saying, "Well, abolition of slavery was not not anything important." They're saying it's capitalism just came and instead of slavery now came wage labor. It's same. I mean, they're trying to deny that there was any moral content to the decision to abolish slavery. Yeah, it was I, just, I mean, <laughs> right. I think the abolition, the decision to abolish <laughs> slavery, the movement to abolish slavery was one of the greatest things in human history. Right. As certainly in the modern era. Uh, and I often say that, you know, I often say, listen, we in the Islamic tradition already did something significant. We abolished slavery. The idea came from the West, from the British. Uh, and uh, the British did other things that I condemn, you know, colonialism, let me get into that. But this, on this issue, it was good. The abolitionist movement was something right. And we Muslims indeed changed our jurisprudence. And this was an important thing. When I say this, I know, and it comes, I say it on Twitter, it'll come. Oh, what's, what's this about? Slavery was... I mean, no, no one will say, let's go back and reestablish it. Some really extreme people will still defend it. I'll tell you that. I mean, mm. ISIS reestablished slavery, right? Sure. So uh, even not as crazy as ISIS, some really hardcore people can say there's nothing wrong with it in principle. But others are saying, well, it was just a change of customs in society. There's nothing moral about it. Because if they say there was something moral about it, they will be accepting that Muslims took a step that is moral in the modern era with modern influence. That yes. really crumbles the whole system. The whole thing goes. Yeah. Before and you know it, you're going well, to start women have equal rights. Yeah, and yeah. yeah it, it, exactly. Well, one of the things I wanted to, to just challenge you on a little bit, I'm not even sure I agree with what I'm about to say, but 
this issue of universal human rights is a, is a big issue in, in Western liberalism, actually, and the extent some Western liberals agree and some don't. Jeremy Bentham and his godson Mill pretty much didn't think it was true, that there was something natural, uh, naturally occurring. And you actually point to, so I guess there's, I'll make two challenges. One is against the idea that there is some obvious, just, you know, hot, unchanging universal set of rights that comes to us purely through reason that's the same everywhere and for all people and number two the challenge will be to say that actually what we call human rights has quite a christian or judeo-christian foundation um and so the first question is like where would these come from if not from a religious background and you actually quote the declaration of independence from jefferson as you know we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal but Jefferson's first draft didn't say that. That was edited. Jefferson's first draft read, we hold these truths to be sacred and inalienable, that all men are created equal and independent. You'll like the independent one. That from that equal creation, they derive rights inherent. And they, a lot of this religious stuff was edited out for reasons that you can probably understand. But nonetheless, there's an argument and there's a strong argument that Western liberalism and human rights and so on stand on Christian foundations, on the idea of this ontological human equal, you know, the equal that you can get from St. Paul and others. And, and that actually, even though maybe it's been stripped of its Christian content now, the Western liberalism and in some ways even secularism is a gift mm -hmm. <laughs> of the revolution that took place in Christianity in terms of the kind of equality of people. And that Islam doesn't have quite that same mm -hmm. uh, resource of that created equal thing. So there's mm -hmm. two challenges there wrapped up in one. Well, uh, the origin of human rights, ultimately the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a convention, right? Humanity, I mean, after Second World War, People came together at the United Nations. You know, they said we agree on these things. So uh, I would compare this to ij ijma in Islamic tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, for, there are four sources of the Sharia: Quran, Sunnah, Qiyas, and Ijma. Ijma is the consensus of the community, Muslim community. Now, of course, now that comes from the belief that there is something that if everybody agrees on something, there must be some truth to it, right? But this was never extended to humanity in general. And because ontologically or epistemologically, humanity doesn't have an ethical compass outside of the Sharia. But according to Mutazila, according to Ibn Rushd, the, the, the kind of branch in Islam that I'm referring to, you can well make the case that there should be an ijma of humanity. And I would see uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as the ijma, that is the consensus of humanity and i would see value in that because i think that humans have an inherent conscience of course that inherent conscience give you like a list of rights right there but when you see oppression you feel sorry for it when you feel somebody being killed for no reason you you feel a remorse for it so there are uh, inherent human values like the mutazila uh, they were when they were debating with the asharites they said if you see somebody uh, uh, dying out of thirst in the de in the desert, and you have a, a water in your hand, you know it's morally right to give him that water. So that kind of a goodness uh, in our nature, which also is you know joined by some evilness, of course, tribalism, hatred, and all that. But but that conscience, and there are some scientific studies now showing that that is something true. And I'm actually yes, I agree with you that this has been very much emphasized in the Christian tradition. Uh, I think uh, Paul, you know, St. Paul says mm. it is, I mean, you know the uh, quote better than me probably, it's written in their hearts. I mean, even the Gentiles, they don't know God's law, but it's written in their hearts. Is, am I going, putting it right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, it's written in their hearts. Uh, and, yes. and in the book, I said the notion of conscience has been strong in Christianity because it's not a legalistic religion, unlike Judaism uh, and Islam. So I actually see Christianity on one uh, one end of the spectrum there, and Judaism and Islam as legalistic religion as as together. Uh, on. But this doesn't mean that what Paul said, uh, what Saint Paul said there. Uh, by the way, Muslims, we Muslims and Jews generally don't agree with Saint Paul on theology, <laughs> on the nature of God. That's a different question. But on I th I like his uh, take on conscience. 
But what I'm saying is that what he said there had Islamic counterparts. The mm-hmm. Mutazila was saying the same thing. Yeah, Ibn the Rush same idea. Pointing, uh, yeah, so that, he, I, I mean, historically, it's not been emphasized enough. Yeah. Uh, but to me, yeah. it's just a um, historical baggage, that historical heritage that we need to reconsider today. Because I think you come to that end. If you say, we are obeying these things only because God said so, and God said these things only because whatever he says is true, you just start to collapse onto your written tradition, whatever that is, and, and the growing ethical gap between you and the rest of humanity becomes a problem. And I see it in the world of Islam. Honestly, I see in, in some extreme currents in Israel too today, I mean, who don't believe in universal human dignity. I certainly see it in, 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 my, in my old world. And, and of course, Christianity falls into the same trap when it becomes an Oswald system identity. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, probably you see this in the comes, Christian word. Yeah. I mean, it comes, you, know, you have this, I mean, you point to this great this survey showing that in the US, Muslims are more tolerant now of same sex marriage than white evangelical Christians. And that was in one of your columns, I think, yeah. which we'll, we'll link to. Um, and I think, and I, I agree, the fact that these themes of equal dignity do recur in different ways, and you draw, you do draw on the Islamic tradition to make, I would say, a sort of quasi Pauline point. Right. Maybe it's not quite as strongly as yeah. Paul makes it. When we look at the world today, and I was actually looking at your report on freedom in the Islamic world earlier today, one of my questions is whether this is a problem with Islam or whether this is a problem with Arabic Islam. In fact, there are majority Islamic nations, including in uh, Eastern Europe in particular, Eastern and Central Europe, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and so on, which have very different polities and score high in terms of most of your freedom indices by stark contrast to most of the Arabic um, Islamic uh, countries. Also, the Muslims living in places like the US and the UK, as we just referred to, have you know, pretty liberal views uh, by and large. I don't want to exaggerate, but by and large, right? Um, and certainly by and large don't want the US to become an Islamic theocracy. Uh, they, they want Islam to be supported Free. and yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yes they want Respect. pluralism but they, right, there are very few u.s muslims want want you know u.s and so it seems like there's this huge diversity within the islamic world and so just how far is this you you, you almost position this as a problem with islam you have to fix islam first you have to liberalize islam before you can liberalize islamic countries but aren't there already pretty liberal islamic countries uh, there are, and I, I'd certainly make that argument too. And uh, in the book, in Reopening Muslim Minds, I am focusing on troubling attitudes in the contemporary Muslim world that come from Islam. I'm not saying that those attitudes define all Islamic world. I mean, that uh, some of the there's no religion police in Bosnia <laughs> or right. Albania, even in yeah, Turkey. You can go, right? you, you can go there safely. Yeah, and <laughs> and in Turkey too, there's no religion police. Right. There's uh, Turkey has other problems. I always joke, like in Turkey, there is a very draconian blasphemy law, but it's not about insulting God or the prophet. It's about insulting the president. So mm-hmm. we have a cult of personality problem in it's Turkey. It's a political and, blasphemy. Yeah, it's, it's political yeah. blasphemy. And, yeah. and certainly uh, there are problem. There are Muslim-majority countries that are quite free, uh, as I showed in my Cato Institute report, Freedom in the Muslim World. You today tweeted about that. I was happy mm. to see that. Thank you. Mm. Uh, countries like Bosnia, Herzegovina, Albania, Muslim, they are Muslim majority. They are as free as Greece or Argentina. Uh, West African countries like Burkina Faso are quite free. Uh, in Central Asia, uh, you have political authoritarianism. But when you look at women's rights, when you look at social attitudes in countries like Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan, you don't have any. Uh, really a concerning problem. You have political problems there. And, and that is because those countries are leftovers from the Soviet, you know, one party, one, one uh, state party state uh, tradition. Mm-hmm. So it is a complex mix. And uh, reopening Muslim minds doesn't claim to address all the problems in the Muslim world, which would include secular authoritarianism as well, tribalism, um, all sorts of things. But I'm looking into the religious issue, which is an, an, a concerning authoritarian interpretations of religion, which is concerning not in Bosnia, but certainly in certain Arab countries, in Pakistan, in Malaysia, in, in, in a province of Indonesia, the Aceh province. So uh, there are, and, and, and also when those attitudes are still there, 
it can even lead to extremism. I mean, extremism is not totally disconnected with the problem I'm speaking about. It's just on steroids, right? Like the, yeah. the typical example, I mean, why we had attacks on Charlie Hebdo cartoonists or after those cartoons, terrorist attacks in France, which I condemn. Why did we have those? Well, to be frank, because the idea that the blasphemer should be killed is there in, 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 the, in the mainstream tra tradition. Traditional moderate scholars will tell you that, no, 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 you can't do it by yourself. You, it's not on a vigilante basis. This can be only implemented in a Muslim-majority country and with a proper court decision. So that is a much milder this position than saying you should kill people in the middle of Paris. But the people who do that are acting on a certain, yes. a certain jurisprudence. So extremism is a, I, I say extreme is a alarm call, a wake-up call for the conservative authorities to think, rethink these issues because their implications can be endlessly troubling. One of the things I admire about the book is the way you really do take this back to its roots. And you're saying, effectively, there are some people who say, there's no problem with Islam. You know, Islam is a peaceful religion. No, no, nothing, to, no, nothing to see here. And then there's a bit other people saying jihad. And what you're saying is, no, there is something to see here. And we have to figure out what are the theological and uh, legal and cultural roots of some of these problems uh, if we're to stop these out these outcroppings of course they're you know by definition an extremist is just at one end of a distribution and what you're doing is yeah. challenging the whole distribution one quite final question i had for you was the extent to which you need a it's almost where we started a liberal islam in order for islam to flourish in liberal societies because you you there are two projects which you've connected in your last remark which is we need a more liberal islam in order for islam to flourish in liberal you know, and sustain liberal and pluralist societies but you know i i wonder if it isn't possible once you get to pluralism to have quite illiberal religions so long as they're not coerced as long as you have exit power you actually quote i think kukathas line about yeah. the right to leave the community and i'm thinking about the us right now I mean, the amish are pretty illiberal there's quite a few Mormons are pretty liberal. There's quite a lot of evangelicals quite illiberal, but you can leave them if you want to. Um, and actually, if I even chose to follow some of the, you know, the Sharia or even some of the Hadiths, let's say I'm a Muslim and I decide to leave twice as much of my money to my sons as to my daughters because I'm following. Fine, I just write the, my will that way, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, There's just yeah. no U.S. Yeah. law. So, and so I just wonder whether, that, to some extent, how far does the message of we need a much more liberal Islam? help in the cause of saying we could have actually quite a conservative Islam so long as it's not a coercive and you say statized like it so long as it's not coercive and it doesn't control the state fine then if you want to be just like a conservative Jew or a conservative mm -hmm, Christian mm -hmm. fine no problem is that basically where you land on this yeah I mean I'm that's why I emphasize I'm speaking of classical liberalism I'm speaking of classical liberalism I'm speaking of John Locke like uh, first of all I mean to come to the earlier point you made, John Locke didn't say there is no problem in Christianity today. He said, we Christians have problems, but this is how we can solve this. I mean, so he criticized divine rights of kings or the idea that the uh, magist civil magistrate should, you know, impose one doctrine. He, he criticized them, again, in the name of Christianity, but he admitted the problems. I think we, we in Islam today, in certain parts of the Islamic world, we are, we are in a stage we just need exactly that. And what is that? That is what you say. I always say I have no problems Muslims being as conservative, as traditional as they are. I'm not trying to secularize Muslim societies. I'm just trying to say in those societies, there will be different ways of life. Some people will be not that pious. Some people will be maybe atheist or secular. That should be tolerated. And the state should not uphold one group against the other. In Pakistan... Some people may, will be super Sunni conservative, but they're Ahmadis. They should be equal citizens. And funny, the funding, the foundation of Pakistan was based on that thing. I mean, Muhammad Ali Jinnah has this great speech in 1947, and he said, uh, you're free to go to your temples or mosques. It's not the business of the state. You are free to be as religious as you are. But later came the so-called Islamization wave in Pakistan, which by law dictated that the Ahmadis are non-Muslims and, 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 and now chanting in the streets saying Shi'ar Kafir and people should be jailed and even killed for blasphemy. So uh, 
There are already forces of the liberalism that I'm speaking about in, in, the, uh, in the Muslim society, but I'm discussing why did it come back? And uh, there's a sociological aspect to it, but there, is, there are also unresolved issues in doctrine. And my book is, is trying to uh, deal with those issues. Within those illiberal communities, I would defend as civil society their rights, but one more thing that I would emphasize is still I would encourage individualism in the sense that individuals should not give their uh, conscience, you know, as, as totally sub- subsume it to a great leader, whether that could be a religious leader and so on and so forth. So I, I call for individuality as well in the Muslim consciousness. But that's not a policy. That's, a, that's something you can talk about. I still will defend the right of a conservative Muslim community, an Amish-type Muslim community, to be uh, pious in that way and be happy about it. it. Just, you know, they should not uh, create an Islamic state and impose their way of life to the rest sure, of the citizens. Sure, or, e- or even have customs that make exit power difficult. So you want a chosen commitment to yeah, Islam exactly. or a chosen commitment to something else. Well, Mustafa, it's uh, work that has required you not just in this book, but more generally to be a theologian, a historian, a philosopher, a political scientist, a commentator on current events in your own country of Turkey, but elsewhere too, but also to have shown some not inconsiderable personal courage. And that's not true of all the the work that's done in these kinds of spaces. So I congratulate you not only on the work itself, but thank you for your own personal commitment to this cause, which it's hard to think of a more important one for the world today. So thank you, and thank you for joining me. Thank you, Richard, for your very kind and uh, encouraging words. I hope I will deserve all of that. Uh, But this was a great conversation, and uh, thank you, and let's do it again. Sure. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate, and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.